Um, we heard today we bring um, a very serious topic, uh, but I wanted to make it to where it's real. The idea is, is that uh, uh, it is called mental ebbs and flows. We have a thing about mental health, and I really believe that we need to talk about that. We're all going through every day, whether the pandemic hit or not, uh, we don't realize that we have our, our peaks and valleys. And I think mental ebbs and flows plays into real estate. I think it's a fantastic uh, play on the uh, uh, acronym of what's out there. So again, I'm Desiree Patno. I'm your host today um, and every week. Uh, this happens at Wednesday at 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And I am the founder and CEO of NRB, the Women in Housing Real Estate Ecosystem. I also am uh, the chairwoman of the NDLC, our Diversity Inclusion Leadership Council. And also I run my own real estate brokerage. I've been in the business for over 35 years, uh, selling assets across the nation. And as a global speaker, I'm really about the ecosystem of bringing uh, the uh, health and the quality of life for everything that touches land. So I'm very excited because this is real. This is about where we live, where we work, but we have to be at our mental state and we have to be the best we can be. Um, and we need to have some um, conversation about the real um, ideas and things that are going through our minds. So the more we can talk about, the better it helps us and it helps the people that are listening and have the eyes and ears on it. So thank you very much. We are streaming on Facebook Live right now. This will also be uh, covered on uh, YouTube, iTunes, Anchor, um, our website for nrb.com in addition to all the different platforms. So thank you, thank you, Leora. Thanks for having me as always. It's a pleasure catching up with you and um, getting into, into some real talk. So let's, That's right. let's do it. <laughs> real talk. Well, where do we get the real talk? So I started a program a year and a half ago where I wanted all our certified delegate spokeswomen. And so let me give the titles real quick. So Leora is the uh, certified NRB, uh, certified delegate spokeswoman. So thank you for being on our, our board. Um, and also she's the board of directors for 2020 Vision for Success with Christine Beckwith, which we absolutely love. She's phenomenal. And her former job was SVP at Wholesale Operations. And so one of the things that's really incredible about the pandemic is the opportunity to evolve, change, and get a new narrative. So that's where we're at with the Yora right now. But I wanted to take a step back real quick. Um, the We started about a year and a half ago and I really had a push. And I know Leora, you came to me and said, do you really want me to go deep into the thought process? And what do you really want me to say? I said, I want you to be real authentic and say everything and anything you wanna say. And she took the time I don't know how long it took you to write your journal bio, but you really dug really deep into your things like you've never told anyone else before, your experiences, and you came back to me and you said, Desiree, this was great in the sense of the exercises, putting it down, the release of it. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that experience, because I think it'll be a great play into the mental ebbs and flows. Right. So creating my journey bio for for this position of being a delegated uh, delegate spokeswoman, it was difficult because, again, I I tend to overshare sometimes. And when I want to speak about my journey, I want it to be real. And I'm not one of those people that that like to just paint the pretty picture like a lot of people do on social media, where they only share the happy times and the perfect photos and the perfectly quaffed hair and, and all of that. Yeah, exactly. And all the filters and all of that. My life, when I share it, is unfiltered and real and authentic. And so when I built my journey bio, which to be honest with you, did not take long at all because once I started writing, it just kind of poured out of me. And there were times when I was writing my journey bio where I was crying because I was, you know, I was reliving parts of my life and parts of my past that are painful. Um, I spoke about things that I hadn't spoken about in a long time. And I, it made me nervous to actually put it on paper and memorialize some of the things that I've gone through. Because again, these, these are things I've not shared, uh, definitely not in a public space space like that so um but it was very it was very cathartic and it, it was it was a it was an experience like a release of of all of this this pain and frustration and and loss that i've experienced over over the years and so um i'm very proud of of, of sharing my story with others and and of course when i share my story it always comes from a place of if i can help one person who's gone through something similar, then it's worth it, even if it means I lose friends along the way um, for being too real or being too authentic. Uh, if if people can't handle the the unpretty parts of my life, then they're not, 
therapy shouldn't be in my life anyway. So that, you know, it's, uh, but it's, it's tough. It's tough putting yourself out there, especially when it comes to talking about mental health and, and the perception that, you know, if you're in a senior leadership role or, or you're someone who's very active and well-known within, within the industry that you have your quote unquote you know, stuff together. And that's not always the case. And, and so um, th that's, what's important to me is letting people know, Hey, you know, we're all going through stuff and it's even more magnified going through something as crazy as the pandemic has been. You know, you bring up an interesting point uh, about leadership. Um, you know, I think honestly, you know, when I look back at the, the things that you posted and everything else about, um, finding yourself and, and, you know, the, the, everyone has to step together, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an interesting thing. You go and you look at, oh, well, what kind of profile do they have on the social media? What are they talking about? Do they have a perfect image for our company? And if you think about that conversation, um, if you're functioning in a real way, that means that, and you've had these issues and, and things that have come up from your past that are really um, unbelievable that uh, and go through, you are actually the person who can handle diversity, handle impact and continue to pick up and go. Not all people can. And so those are the things that I like to highlight that um, when we're going through these peaks and valleys, that as we're down, it's the people you want to be able to continue to get back up and they can share their experiences that you're not the only one in the shop that's gonna have those experiences. Maybe not the same narrative, but you can take a piece out, whether someone has had a loss um, of, some, of someone they loved, to someone who's had an addiction, someone who's had you know, a, a problem with their a previous relationship, whatever it is, there is a component of your experience as a leader that you're able to help navigate the, the, those who are coming up and right. working with others. So I believe that sometimes, um, and that's why I created the journey bio. It wasn't about our professional um, resume and about, oh, look at me, you know, I've done this and this and this, and this is my great experience is if I know how to pull something out of you that your best friend doesn't know, your parents don't know, and you're now bringing it out of the closet um, in a bigger way that's about things that have harbored within your system, then people can understand you better because you go to the doctor and we're talking about this. You go to the doctor. A doctor can only help you based on what you tell them. Yeah, they can take your blood pulse. They can take, you know, you can see your skin. They can see whatever, but that's only cursive. I don't believe that's the real core of what's going inside. You know, a dog can't talk. He can show you emotion with their body where we can talk and communicate. So that has to be a way that you're in your mind, not in your mind. Well, that's not normal. I guess it is from a third party perspective and or from a doctor who can see signs coming. So I think it's so important uh, to say what you really feel and then sometimes we might be in that moment, but at least we cross that barrier that the thought was there, right? Versus then, mm -hmm. then we didn't have that thought. I mean, they say one of the two biggest differences is between someone who's um, who's a, a mass murderer, and not, I shouldn't say mass murderer, someone who kills someone who not, is the difference they know when to stop because right. they go, oh my gosh, I'm just so <clears throat> upset. And then they go, well, wait a second, that's, you know, calm down, take a breath, take a thing. And I believe that, you know, when you go through these struggles. Um, so what has been, I guess, one of the greatest things for you, I mean, we can go into the three rules. Uh, let's start with something fun. I'm always about the fun facts. So what's something so fun that Leora hasn't told me before? Cause I ask this every time you get on stage, I ask you every time I see you. So what is so fun that's different about Leora that no one knows and everyone is uh, watching this is gonna go, I had no idea she did that. You know, that's tough because I'm an open book. I mean, I like know. I said, I, I tend to overshare. Um, I, I mean, a lot of people know how I got my start into writing is because I'm, a, I'm very passionate about the Denver Broncos as, as crappy as they've been over the last five years. And, <laughs> and uh, I got my start because I was live tweeting Bronco games and it caught the attention of uh, a couple of 
uh, NFL, uh, you know, news sites. And so I started being a beat writer for the Denver Broncos. And that's how I got my start writing for Mortgage Women magazine. So um, I, I didn't, I didn't want to be a journalist. That was not something I was ever interested in. And I've kind of fell into that kind of, you know, uh, you know, backwards uh, because of just me being my loud, obnoxious self uh, and complaining about how crappy the Broncos are on Twitter. Um, I love to sing. I'm very passionate about singing. And if you put me in front of a microphone at a karaoke bar, you might hear me sing some Heart or some, uh, you know, Carrie Underwood or some, even some Mariah Carey if I've had enough liquid courage. So, um, but music liquid is really courage. Okay. liquid courage, liquid if you courage. know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of it called liquid courage, but okay. I like that. That's a very cool one. I, I, I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, but singing has always been a passion of mine. I, I was a, I wouldn't say I was a professional singer, but I was professionally trained all throughout junior high and high school. I would compete in uh, competitions when I was in high school. And there was a brief period of time where I was going to try out for American Idol, but then I, I got scared and didn't do it, uh, which is something I've always regretted because who knows, right? You, you, you know, the only, uh, you never know what, what, what paths you could end up on if you don't take the chance, if you don't take the risk. But when, whenever, you know, staying on the theme of mental ebbs and flows, everyone has that, that thing that keeps them grounded and is there saving their, their you know, their safe space when they, when they're struggling right. or happy, sad, whatever the case may be, that is really music for me. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm so passionate about music. I'm, I'm that person who can name that tune in one note and it drives my husband oh, yeah, absolutely crazy. Yeah, yeah. My sister's like, why haven't you tried out for that show? You would win the million bucks, like no problem. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I should probably do that. But I know like every song, even the songs that I don't like. So uh, it's it's weird. I have this thing where I can hear a song and then I can hear it once and then I can sing it. I just, I have this, but I can't read sheet music. It's very strange. But um, anyway, so that's some funny things that mo some people may not know about me. <laughs> I Okay, so this, oh, this is so fantastic. So uh, my chorus is that if you think about the what name that song okay so think about it we're what we're in isolation so Eb, so cutie say hi so yeah so time sorry interruption there you go we're being real here we're being authentic time to go walk the dogs all right so <laughs> <laughs> so let's okay i have this gig and completely okay so metal ups and flows think about what we what is the number one thing and you get one answer What's the number one thing that out of the 21 centuries that we are dealing with right now that is the same whether we're on a digital platform or we're in person? Uh, well, I don't know all the 21 centuries, so you, you've caught me at a disadvantage here. Um, um, connection? Song. Music. Song. Oh, okay. So that if makes I sense. Was if I would name one note during this right now, you would immediately put the endorphins of how that song relates to your, your body would change the environment of when you heard it or if it's special to you or something, go with it. Oh, Whether yeah. you're in person or on a digital format. Everything else, oh, the wind, how it's blowing against me, the cold environment, how we hear, how we sound, how we, how we um, um, uh, see, you know, all the different elements of the normal five sensories, but there's 21 because of the, how I'm moving, how I, you know, the hit, how it's hitting me and, and the different uh, uh, directional stuff. So, but music with the one note will put you in a frame of mind. So my whole thing is, is that we can keep our human element to us. Part of the mental ups and flows is what you turn on a music and what you say, it resets you, right? Mm -hmm. right? So when you bring into the, you know, name that in one note. So we have it down on live right now. She is going to apply for name that note and you better all watch out. So there we go. So look <laughs> at the smile. Look at the smile. So part of mental ability is to change the narrative to make it happy and sad so we found let's see one two three four at least 10 different things about you that are different so i love it i love it so i didn't yep. know that about you after all these things okay there you so go <laughs> there i go so we're gonna kick this off into the core meat of um as i turn on my phone here to get them 
Um, gotta love it. So all of you who know me, um, yes, I did buy an Apple. I broke down and bought a, um, an iPhone after owning an Android for 25 years because the whole core was I had to get on Clubhouse. I absolutely love Clubhouse. It is to die for. The audio version of it is just, oh my gosh. So anyway, okay, so topics dealing with the emotional trauma as a result of the pandemic, long periods of isolation, job changes during the pandemic, resisting the urge to make knee jerk decisions based on fear of the future. So I call it, we're trigger happy right now. I think we were trigger happy before the pandemic, during the pandemic, it really became trigger happy. And now that we're in a state of uncertainty of, are we looking at a, at a viral or a bacterial next time? Is this gonna be a state that we're always gonna deal with? And some of have our naysayers. I believe that the trigger happy, a knee jerk reaction is gonna be constant. So number mm -hmm. one, number one rule, listen to your body and your mind. What's that all about? So, you know, we, we, we tend to keep everything inside, especially those of us who are in the industry that are very public in the, in this, and of course, this, this transcends beyond real estate. This is, you know, anyone who's in a high profile role within, within any industry, they're very public on social. They, they may tend to hide the difficult times, or they may tend to hide physical things that they might be going through out of fear of rejection, retribution, judgment. And, and when, when you hold everything inside the mental stuff, it actually starts to, to manifest itself in physical ways in the body. So, um, and I've spoken about this before last summer, when I had just moved to California, I moved to California literally a month before everything was shut down. And so I'm living in, I'm living in a state that I had never lived in before. I didn't have my family with me at the time. So I was truly alone in a town that I had never lived in before. I was isolated in a tiny apartment, working a new job. And so I was dealing with a lot of stressors uh, in my life. And then you add to that, now, now we're dealing with this pandemic. My family's in Chicago, which at the time was a very, uh, was not a good place for the pandemic. It was, it was one of the hotbeds of, of, you know, fast spreading of the infection. Um, but I had this new job and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm dealing with panic. I'm dealing with anxiety, but I can't show it because my new employer is going to be like, did we just hire a crazy person? Did we hire someone who can't handle this job? Uh, so I started to just internalize all of that. There were periods of time where I was literally in front of my, my desk, like I could feel the panic coming. And so I would have to escape and I'd go for a walk or I'd go for an early lunch and I would just hide the fact that I was really struggling with panic and anxiety. Uh, and it got to a point where I, I got physically sick. Like I, it was killing my immune system. I, I was picking up every cold out there and I was constantly run down and tired. And I, it got to a point where every single day it was difficult just to get out of bed. And it's because I was again, hiding what I was going through and hiding what I was feeling. And it, it took me being real and just saying, look, this is what I'm currently going through. Um, I'm, I'm afraid for my family in Chicago. I'm, I'm afraid for what's going on right now because there were so many unknowns and I'm afraid that you guys are gonna think you made the wrong decision in hiring me because I'm dealing with some of these emotional things. And just being open and honest released a lot of that panic. It released a lot of that anxiety and I started to feel better. Um, but it was a long road during the summer. I, it got to a point where I just, I had to go to a doctor and say, look, I, I need some help because I'm not doing very well on my own with this. And it, it took a lot of courage to do that because again, it's, you know, you're in this high profile job, you're on social, you, you do all these podcasts, you know, you're, you're, you tell people that you know you, that you've got your stuff together and yet here you are you're having mental breakdowns on the side of the freeway in the middle of California like what's going on with you and I'm like this is real this is and I can tell you there's people out there who deal with this every single day and they they just internalize it because they because of fear fear of that judgment fear of that oh well then maybe they're not somebody that we would want to have on a future podcast or maybe there's somebody that we would pass up for a promotion because they're they're dealing with some stuff and it, I would rather it, it's not worth it to me to to hide that stuff and to internalize it because it 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 takes away from me being my real authentic self and recovering 
from these periods of mental ebbs and flows. And so I, I had to let go of that fear and just work on myself. And that's what it means to listen to your body and your mind, you know, um, tune out the noises, tune out the, the judgments, tune out what you, the perceptions that you think other people see of you and listen to what your body and your mind are telling you when you need to take care of you, that should take precedence over everything else. If hundred percent, thousand percent agree. If you don't reset your, your mind is only as good as your body feeds it. It is your nutrients. And if we can't allow our, our body not to be fed well, then the brain doesn't function. And if we don't get the mind time to reset and, and get into deep realm sleep and have the ability to, um, reduce itself to where we're functioning then we get to an endless cycle that we start making trigger trick or knee jerk as you call it uh reactions and then we have to deal with consequences that go with it i mean you sitting on the side of the road you you know uh, you internalizing that you're not there when you're having the you're you're mentally just nervous of being there that you react too fast and then you take a moment to go get a breath then is that going to be a common occurrence? Like you said, I didn't want to get on bed. Do I go in the office? Is it something that I want to show up? Those whole uh, abilities to interact, then you start doubting yourself. I mean, so you can go down a very slippery path and, and get into this rabbit hole that you can't kind of like, how do I get out? Um, and the end game, as my mother always said, mind over matter. Your mind can cure yourself. Your mind can help yourself, but your mind can kill yourself. So the ability is, as you say, um, listen to your body and mind is so important that as we age, now I'm a whole, I could be your mom. God, what a thought that would be, Leora. <laughs> I'm old enough to be your mom. All right. So moving on, Desiree. Uh, <laughs> but, um, if you were to think about, we have to be in the moment to, to enjoy but then also look for the future. And when we wake up, we've got to be excited. And I think that's one of the things that the mental ebbs and flows is, is uh, keeping the mind healthy is we got to go back to getting up, whatever our routine was before the pandemic, get back up and do it, whether it's getting made up, whether it's getting to um, the ability. Now, no, I don't put my high heels on in the house, uh, but the kind of health is do where we feel good about ourselves. We have a similarity routine that gets us back into the groove. And as we evolve, it's okay. But to do that abruptness, and like you said, have to have it. So very good. I love rule number one. And you touched on rule number two a little bit. Seek help when you need it. So you <clears throat> found out that it's time to go. How, how, how was it that you only got the courage? Not only did you get the courage and, and was this is your first time, and is it something that you felt that you could help others that have gone and seeked help, but they didn't like help? Because I know when I went through my divorce uh, 30 plus years ago, um, and I, I went to a marriage counselor, I went to someone who dealt with the after fallout of the effect, and I did not like the woman at all. She, it was very irritating. It actually made me worse than better. And this is gonna sound very vain, very crazy, but I actually went out and said, for the amount of money I'm paying you, that you're not helping me and making me feel better, you know, help me through this process. I could go buy a diamond ring and I could look at every day and feel so much better than mm -hmm. what you're doing for me. And I did that. I literally want <laughs> a diamond ring to be my mental reset. And every day I look at it, go, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, I feel good. And it literally got me through the process then going to it because I just couldn't deal with my divorce at the time 30 years ago. So how do you feel about going to the doctor um, and, and getting in that frame and, and finding good doctors or bad doctors? And how do you do it, associate with it's, that? It's so tough because I've, you know, how many people have, have gone to therapy or, you know, have, have seen a therapist for whatever the, you know, for whatever reason, it's, it's so commonplace, but it's still taboo to talk about it, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, back in the beginning of 2000, uh, 2003, 2004, I had suffered a loss. I had suffered, uh, I had lost a child uh, in pregnancy. I was 32 weeks when um, my daughter was still born and uh, I was in a really bad place after she passed away. And there were a few months where I couldn't get out of bed. 
I was questioning everything. It just it made no sense to me at the time how you can make it that far into the pregnancy and then lose the child. Um, and I, I was drinking to, I was to, to numb my, to numb my pain and to numb the loss and not, and I wasn't grieving properly. And I realized that. And so I, I, I saw it help and I went to, to find a therapist and I feel there needs to be a better process for the vetting of therapists and, and that the therapists need to really be therapists that are subject matter experts on the reason why someone is seeking help. So for me, uh, they, I was, I was put together with a male therapist who had never had a child before. And so I'm sitting with this guy and I'm like pouring my heart out and bawling my eyes out and I'm not connecting with him in any way. And it's because he couldn't in any way understand what I was going through, not even as a woman, but even as a parent. And so I, you know, I saw him for maybe two or three times and I was like, this is, this is not working for me. And so I feel that there needs to be more done to really assign a therapist to somebody based on what it is that they're needing help with. Um, and so what I did, and this was right when Facebook for, first started being a bigger thing, um, uh, these Facebook groups. And so I found a Facebook group of other women who had suffered a loss in the same month and year that I did. And we, we grieved together and we still talk to this day. And it's been 18 years. I can't believe I'd have an 18 year old daughter. That's crazy. Anyway, um, off topic, you know, but, uh, um, and we were the September, 2003 angels. That's the name of the Facebook group. We're still together. We still talk. And, um, is, is this like, uh, you know, what therapy looks like? Maybe, I don't know, but I have, I have found that, you know, talking to a professional doesn't work as well for me as finding people who have gone through similar experiences. And I, I call it my tribe. I have a tribe of women within the mortgage industry who we've created this tribe throughout the course of the pandemic. And there's women in that tribe that I would ride or die for, but I've never met in real life. And I'm hoping someday we can make that happen. But it, it's amazing how we've been able to transcend these connections, even though we've never physically met. Um, but we were all bonding over these similar experiences where we miss seeing each other. And some of us have gone through some really difficult things during the pandemic, like a job loss or the loss of a family member or getting COVID and having to recover. And, and so for me, that's what therapy looks like for me, maybe different for other people, but, but that's what's helped me get through the really difficult times. That, that is, that is so cool. I mean, I, I never even thought of that in the sense that I, I, um, having a Facebook angel tribe of, I mean, the fact that you went to the same month and same year, not that, that level of, of, you know, okay, we same loss in the same year, but to have that many women in the same month and same year, I just, it blows my mind. Um, but I think that's awesome. Um, but yeah, I have no idea how you even vet a doctor today. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, there's doctor specialists, but how would you vet a doctor for mental health that lists on them? These are the, like you go to a law, you know, go to lawyer, you know, yes, I'm right. you know, I, I do these kind of things. What a, I, you know what? I think that's fantastic because you get to see the women talk and you don't have to chime in. You literally can see their conversation. And that's what I love about Clubhouse is that you get to be live interaction instantaneously, real time where posting, you get to see and, and, and be involved um, and, and chime in as a tribe and come back. But that is very interesting, I, I you know? So I think that's, that should be a to-do list. We should literally have a way that we can vet um, our health doctors for our mind as much as our body, the specialty mm -hmm. that they bring. I don't know. I'll definitely, uh, anyone that's out there listening, if you know, let us know um, and please post on it. Um, but I'll definitely, with the NIH, the National uh, Institute of Health and see if that's an initiative, if not, if, um, definitely think it needs to be out there because if you think of the pandemic, you think of uh, just, if you ever get a sense of feeling back in this moment, if the moment passes, your reset button's gonna be huge, whether you have a physical mm -hmm. condition, a mental condition. Wow, 
that's crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's tough because you, you, you can only go through that experience so many times before you're like, I'm tired of rehashing my story yeah. as I search for the therapist or the, the health doctor or the mental health doctor that works best for me. And so some people just may not even try anymore because they're so frustrated that they haven't found that connection uh, yeah. and really work through the steps to heal. Um, and, and I know that's what I did. I, I gave up after, you know, trying a couple times and not finding that connection that I needed and really feeling like I, like you was worse off than I was before I met with these particular doctors. Wow. They didn't have Facebook back then. That's <laughs> why <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a tribe. Um, but I, you know, I I'm just blown away right now. I, my mind is just going a hundred miles away, you know, as a, as someone who thinks futuristic on the steps. So Right. That being said, think about, you know, we're, we think about our audience being a lot of real estate finance, the ecosystem of life. But my thought is that's one of the reasons the correlation is, is that when we went through the foreclosure crisis and we went through the, or the financial crisis, I call it foreclosure crisis, is how to deal with that next chapter, the loss of a loved one, loss of a job, losing the house, whatever, that tribe of communication was the ability that they were not listening. It was deaf ears. And that's exactly what the man who could not experience or relate to you from a parent, that exact experience of, of not being able to communicate and receive and understand your predicament. Oh, wow. What a, what a right. thought. So right. number one, number two, listen to your body and mind. Number two, seek help when you need it. Number three, love yourself even when you shouldn't. That's an interesting role. Um, I'm dying to hear about this one. So go for it. I, you know, it's, we're, we're not all perfect. We've all done terrible things or just, we've all, we've all hurt other people. We've all um, made the wrong choice. We've all made knee jerk reactions based on situations. And it's usually at those times when we're really, really hard on ourselves. I'm such a failure. I'm such an idiot. I'm so stupid. What have I done? I'm not worthy. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go hide in my little hole and, and, and just, you know, self-loathe, right. And be the victim. And, and that's, it's at those times when you should be doing the exact opposite. And, and I'm, I'm really bad at this. And it's something I continually work on is I'm super hard on myself when I make mistakes. Like right now, um, just to be completely honest with you, I'm currently looking for my next career opportunity. And I have spent the last two weeks trying to figure out what, what could I have done differently? And now I'm in a position where I could be negatively affecting my family because I'm the major bread breadwinner in my, in my home. And, and instead of, and so instead of being hard on myself about that, I need to just take a look at the situation, figure out what I can learn from it and, and apply that to my next career opportunity, whatever that might be, whatever that might be, and not make a knee jerk reaction on what that next opportunity is going to be because I'm because of desperation or because I'm, I'm a fear of not being employed or getting in a situation where I can't financially care for my family. So I'm, I'm, I need to be easier on myself and not so hard on myself. And that's, and that's really what it means to love yourself, even when you shouldn't. Um, and forgiving yourself for when you've made mistakes and forgiving yourself when you've, you've gone down the wrong path for a little while. And it's, it's never too late to get on the right path, but you need to understand that you are still someone who's worthy of love and you're still someone who's worthy of, of good things. And so that, that's really what that means for me. Um, because when you're, when you're in that place, it, a lot of times the only person that will love you is yourself. I don't know if it's say either the only person will love you. I think that sometimes we feel um, that, and I believe this wholeheartedly, that we have to be, we have to love ourselves to others to love us because it, we shut them out. And it's not that other people don't love us. And so I've always heard that, you know, when someone's ill or someone, um, we have a misfortune, uh, we're in between jobs, whether we cause it or something else causes it or just things happen, like a new CEO comes in and, and does a complete slate of everyone that's in the tribe. 
um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons that we're in between jobs. You know, it, it could be the best thing. And I always look at it as a, you've got to look at it as a prime opportunity. The issue is, is that when we have the new opportunity and the fit no longer works, or there's a reason the fit doesn't work, um, or changes in the environment, we have to embrace that opportunity. Like right now, you know, you're, 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 you're worried about the family. You're worried about as a breadwinner, you're, you're, you know, what's this going to look like? We have to make the moment that we still have to live and be there for our family and, and our ability to embrace love. And, and that's one of the hardest, hardest things for me is I get so wrapped up in my love of a work and love of what I do that I forget that you have four kids, you have three dogs, you have this, you have that, and they're not switch on, switch off. You have to be in the moment. So I believe that as you as we go through uh, especially the higher the food chain you go up, you have to really embrace um, that. Okay, to, I have this time with my family. I need to embrace that time. I still have to have my time that I I, I spend my hours, whatever that time frame is, whether it's six hours, eight hours, or whatever, to craft and hone and better my search and what I'm doing as my job. But I still have to be there in whatever that time frame was for my family, as if I, I check my job and leave it at the office. So to do that is so hard. Um, trust me, I'm you're I'm the worst person <laughs> to to make that comment. But I have I've learned that you know going into my beautiful years that uh -huh. uh, I've got to relax more and say. It doesn't matter all the stuff anymore because what happens if you weren't here tomorrow? What is that going to look like? And so my best advice to everyone who's listening to that is here we hear and Leora, you know, spell out her, her, her life and, and how, and we haven't got into the deep, 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 you know, it's all mm -hmm. out. And she said, add on airbnb.com under forward slash delegates under, under her, you'll see her professional bio, but then underneath you click on it, you'll see her journey bio to talk about all the unbelievable things that she's lived through um yet at the same time we have got to embrace the fact that can you get up can you smile uh is there a, an opportunity of of a thought to further our our development in mind and matter and to help others as we fortitude to the strength and what's interesting is like before we got on this uh, on know the rules of game this morning, you know, I made a comment. Um, as much as I think, uh, you know, I'm 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 not a pro uh, social media except for LinkedIn. I think it's one of the greatest gifts for you know, so people can look and see, you know, without being the fanfare can go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That you know, what business, what you done, where you gone, and and not too much extra fluff, we'll call it. Um, mm -hmm. Clubhouse came along, and um, not to be a plug for them in this platform. But what does it do as a spokeswoman for like you? It allows you to get up on stage and people can't see you, but to talk and hear your emotions and to not be judged. So you have the ability to continue that conversation. And if someone said, Desiree, it wasn't even in your, your session, but you took command, you controlled, and you were able to navigate it. And I, in some ways, I was like, hey, what a great compliment. At the same time, I'm like, well, that wasn't too cool that someone thought that that I can command and I took over the room. But I was in the in the in the sense I was asked to orchestrate it as a moderator and to take that and evolve it. So not, you know, I had to go back and say, was that the cause of the room? Yes, that was okay. So that was the frame to get it done. But I thought, well, that was that was you, you glory hog, you know, like what do you think you're doing? Uh. Right, right? You understand, you know, my, my yes, I do. Going. Um, but to that being said, I think part of the mental ebbs and flows is we doubt ourselves. You always talk about the imposter syndrome. We talk about don't let them share rent. They don't, they're not paying rent to be in your brain. So kick them out. Right. Yep. So I think one of the greatest things then is in Clubhouse, you have the ability to have live, real interaction therapy, not only in your professional, your personal, and whatever you want to deal in life. I mean, some of the things I see in there, I'm like, Seriously? I mean, even for me, that was shocking. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that for someone like to embrace that, and sometimes even though the kids can't get on unless they're over 18, let's say, or they they have an iPhone that can they can come in and log in, 
to hear some of the conversations that are being as parents, that family time, you get into the right group, I think is awesome. So I think for that aspect, like you said in Facebook, because Facebook, Facebook is, you have to wait for someone to be available to chime in to get it done. This is live. So, you know, if we, we, if we talk about, you know, your love yourself and shouldn't, with that being said in the narrative, how do you, how have it been, if you don't mind highlighting um, to dig deep, is when you've been at your worst and you've had to really just find a way to come out, have you found any different support system? Is it okay to go back to the same support system? Or sometimes is it helpful to go to a new support system that gives you new energy? Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that real quick, sorry, is- No, you're fine. Um, there was a gentleman that brought me to tears to no one. I've never met the person. And I heard the story to where a, a boy was four and a half years old. He was dying of um, a, a very, very rare form of cancer. And his dying wish was to have um, Tamu Solani come and see him, which is a famous Finland hockey player, if you don't know. And he's the number one guy in, in hockey, the NHL hockey that his care will never end. He's, he's gotten big delays of the bus moving and he's always about the fans, 100% to the fans. And, and he's been ridiculed by his players and everyone else he since has retired. But anyway, so the, the little boy was, was um, had already been, you know, they, the, the priest had come in, everyone just was there waiting for him to pass because he had completely given up on everything. So Tamo came in and spent a whole day with him, a whole day with no clothes on of, of hockey. He had clothes on, but he had street clothes in as a father because he is a father. He comes in and he literally talks to him for an entire day. And he says this, if you, sorry, when you get well, I will have you sit behind the player's bench on the ice during a hockey game so you can visualize what it's like to be sitting in the bench as the hockey game is going on. The boy makes it through, but the point was it's a whole month that he had to finally get well and turn the thing. And he had to tell his father to his face that the idea was he heard his mother and his father doing everything in their power, but he'd lost 100% will to live. He was completely down the path that he was done that day. And when Tamu came in, it was the new spark that he was gonna do whatever in his mind that he could make sure he's going to live. And the doctors to this day have no idea how he went, got through to change his body to live. Wow. Because he's now 14 years old and thriving. And That's Tammy lived up to his thing. So my, my comment to you in the framework is, have you found other vehicles or ways that have helped you or do you keep going back to the same thing to take that, you know, when other people should, when you feel the love of number three? I really think that it depends. Um, sometimes that support system becomes more of an enabling system where they allow you to stay in that victim space or that uh, what was me space. And uh, I think it takes real courage to, uh, to see that and to be able to break away from it because for a lot of people, that's where they feel safe. Oh, well, this person, you know, empathizes with me and they understand what I'm going through and, and they listen to me when I complain and they listen to me when, um, I'm in my victim space and that, that, that might be helpful in the very beginning when you've gone through something traumatic, but eventually you need to find people who will kick your ass and tell you when it's time to get up and move on. And uh, as I've, as I've gone through my career, I have definitely changed the kind of people that are in my circle because I don't want those people in my life. Those people who, who allow me to feed into the negative places in my head. And so I, and as people grow and as people go through different experiences, that, that sphere of, of influence changes and um, you have to be able to be aware of that and be cognizant of, of, of those people that really aren't healthy for you. Um, and, and so, yeah, I definitely think there, there've been situations where I've had to um, remove people from my life that were always 
just near and dear to me because I came to the realization that they were not helping me with my mental health. They were not helping me during my periods of recovery, that they were keeping me down. Um, and, and there was one such situation that resulted in a divorce. So, you know, um, they, they would feed into that, that negativity. They would feed into that imposter syndrome and, and times when I would try to do things to better myself, like stay healthy, work out, try to lose weight, they would feed me bad food, or they would say, oh, it's just, it's one day, you can try again tomorrow, and then the next day, it's the same thing over and over again, and I'm like, you're not helping me, you're hurting me, and so it, it but it takes, a, it takes a lot for people to see that, and, and to be aware, and to actually make a change, because again, you just, you get into that comfort place, you know, this is what's comfortable for me, this is what I'm used to, um, so yeah, I think, you have to do that. You have to, you have to reassess who those people are in your life, uh, just to make sure that they're, they really care about you and have your best interest at heart. I, I think it's so powerful. I think that, I think you defined a leader. You talked about the leadership at the very beginning as, is that it's, this is not to be expected as a leader or how do we sit in that box as a leader? And yet to you, to me, you're defining the leader in the space of your personal life of how do you're dealing with your um, your mental ebbs and flows. And so you're talking about these are the leadership qualifi- qualities that you have to, you know, uh, that are learned experiences that you can pass down. So to me, that is the most valuable thing that we can learn here all today is, is that as you go through and, and maybe this is a, a situation that could be uh, a little deeper than others, you know, because the way things affect people and how they get done, that you're in, in, in just this, an hour, we have seen how you started and how you evolved. And that is what I've defined as a true leader, not only what you can bring to the professional world, but as in your personal world, because I believe that that the emotional, you know, I talk about the emotional quote right now, or, or the EI as being mm-hmm the number one thing. It's not about the ROI. It's not about the ability to understand what you can bring as a talent if they don't have an emotional set. And for me, you have now amplified, um, not now, but you have displayed it publicly how you've evolved. And to me, you know what you're getting and yet you know how that person has handled it and continue to handle it because I don't believe that anyone is now going to be um, uh, not have those issues, right? That, they, that they're going to have issues that are going to be brought up. And I think it's going to be brought to the forefront of the emotional uh, state is going to be much heavier and we have to be able to be reconciled. So this has been phenomenal. Definitely. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so we learned rule number one, listen to your mind and your body. Rule number two, seek help when you need it. And rule number three, love yourself even when you shouldn't. And we're going to add to that one even when you think no one else is, is there. <laughs> right, right. Because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's um, I want to make sure everyone, and, and yeah, if you don't mind, can we talk about what you've been doing with this 75 day program thing? Because I think it's very powerful that everyone understands that there's incredible underlying currents. Well, and this ties into the tip of the day. So the tip of the day that I that I gave you was spend less time comparing yourself to others. Instead, compare yourself to a previous version of yourself. So um, when, when I went through my mental health thing last summer, one of the things I did when I went to the doctors, I had a complete medical workup and I found out that I was actually diabetic. At the time, I was uh, 235 pounds. It's the most I had ever weighed in my life. Uh, and so those periods where I felt that I was dealing with anxiety, where I was like uh, dizzy, palpitation, stuff like that, that was actually symptoms of high, of high blood sugar. Um, so Mm -hmm. I, I started working on my physical health in addition to my mental health. And so I, I went on a journey, a weight, I wouldn't call it a weight loss journey. It's not a diet. It's a lifestyle change. It's a, you know, um, I have, I I'm diabetic and I will always be diabetic, even though my diabetes is currently in remission. Um, when I found out I was diabetic, I felt like it was a call from my mother. So my mother passed away unexpectedly, uh, 18 months ago from a heart attack, but it was caused by diabetes that was not managed and not cared for. And so I was like, I, I can't end up where my mom did. She was only 63 when she passed away. Mm. Um, 
And so I, that was my call to action. And anybody who knows me knows when I start something, I'm 110%, I go all in. And so over the course of the last uh, almost year, I've lost 75 pounds. My blood sugar is in check. I'm not on any medications. And I was actually able to get off a lot of other medication that I was on for heartburn um, and for migraines. And so, uh, you know, the only, the only things I take now are vitamins. Um, so, uh, but so when I, when I lost all this weight, I decided what's the, what, what can I do now to really take this to the next level? And so I, I did what's called the 75 hard challenge and what it is, it's insane. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it's not 75 easy. It's 75 hard. And there were days where it was almost impossible, but for 75 days, you have to follow a very strict regimen. You can't deviate from it at all. Uh, it's, uh, every day you have to do two workouts each of 45 minutes in length. One of them has to be outside, doesn't matter what the weather is, and you can't do them back to back. So you need to have at least a couple of hours in between each workout. Uh, you have to drink a gallon of water every day, take a progress picture every day, read 10 pages of a nonfiction book. So something, you know, thought leadership, something that, that really expands your mind. Um, and I know fiction does that too, but this was specifically nonfiction. Uh, what else? Oh, you have to follow a, a diet uh, that you can't deviate from at all. So no cheat days, no cheat meals and no alcohol. And so for 75 days, th that was your, that was your life. And it's not, it's not a, you know, it's not a workout plan. It's a mental toughness challenge. And it's meant to really, make you feel uncomfortable. And it's really meant to make you check how it is that you live every single day. And I completed it. I didn't, I didn't deviate. There were days where it was incredibly difficult, especially um, there were days where I was traveling uh, and I would have to like work out at the airport and I was going to the bathroom on the airplane every 30 minutes. People probably thought I was like, I don't know, doing drugs in the bathroom or something. Every 30 minutes I was in there using it. Um, and uh, you know, during, during the 75 day period, I lost my job and I got COVID, but it didn't stop me from completing the challenge. And it's something that I'm really proud of. Um, yeah, I lost 15 pounds. I shed some inches, I toned up, but really it, 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 it showed me that number one, I spend way too much time on stupid stuff. And when I really work on time management, I can do a lot more. If people say, well, how do you get two 45 minute workouts in every day? I was like, well, I spend 45 minutes less surfing TikTok at night on my phone or whatever the case may be. Um, and that, you know, I, uh, I enjoy reading, but not as much as I thought I would. I've never been a big reader, uh, still not really a big reader, but, uh, you know, uh, but that it, I, I'm stronger than I give myself credit for and that um, I'm worthy of more than what I think I'm worthy of. But what I found myself doing is I, I followed this 75 hard challenge on Instagram where other people post their progress pics and I found myself comparing myself to other people. I was like, look at how great they look. They're all ripped after 75 days. They got these big muscles and, and I'm still kind of flabby in certain places. And I, and I was like, I need to stop comparing myself to others. And so I, I, I took a look at my progress pictures from day one to day 75 and, and not just the physical progress pictures, the mental progress that I have made over the 75 day period. And, and so that's really what's important is when you're, when you're going through a journey good, bad, whatever, don't compare yourself to other people. That's, I think that's one of the worst things about social media is you compare your life to what you see other people posting on social. Look at the beautiful house, look at the 2.3 children, look at the white picket fences, the fam you know, the fabulous vacations and, and the perfect skin, the perfect hair. That's not reality. That's not your reality. That's not your life. And so you, you spend less time comparing yourself to others because a lot of those people don't know you. They don't have time for you. They may not even care about you, but you care, you should care about you and just compare yourself to all of the progress that you've made in your life and the lives of those that you care about. Um, because again, it just goes back to renting space in, in your head. These people don't deserve that space in your head and, and don't deserve the time that you give them when you're making these comparisons. Love it. Now you, and they also, people don't realize people post the best about them on social media. They very rarely post the negative side. And you're one of the few that I know that actually goes deep into the weeds of being real, um, you know, who they are and really authentic about it. And I think it's, it's a way also for you to 
let people know, hey, in a broad sense, this is what's going on in my world versus and keep it bottled up. I think it's therapeutic for you. I think it's therapeutic for the people who see it that maybe you can help someone else, but also um, that this is maybe why we haven't been communicative or something going on, you know, to let everyone mm -hmm. know where you sit. Yeah. Pe people know when there's something not great going on in my life because I tend to stop sharing. So I've, I've definitely, over the last few weeks, people have reached out to me just because they know I'm not as active on social as I usually am because, you know, yeah, I share, but sometimes I just need to be with myself and, and go through some things. And again, I have my tribe when I need to reach out, but that's done privately. It's not done actively on social. Um, but yeah, people have come to know when, when they need to reach out to Leora because she kind of <laughs> disappears. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> but I'm okay. I'm doing okay. <laughs> well, you know, what's so cool is think about where we started and look at you now, as soon as we got into the last segment of that, and we started talking about, um, the things at the very end, you lightened up your smile, your, your glow, um, your ability to just have fun with this became a whole new being. And I think that not only from the conversation, but the ability to navigate something resonated with you that you just, whew. so thank you. This is awesome. So not only are you going to see her today, you're going to see Liara tomorrow. So all those who have not getting a lot of social uh, public uh, display of Leora tomorrow, she's <laughs> going to be hosting. We have know yourself. So how much better can it be for NDLC uh, 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 principles and for the month of April is know yourself. So here we're talking about Leora for mental ebbs and flows, which we just heard. You can catch all the details of all the different things that you talked about on in very high depth into, like I said, interview.com forward slash delegates under Leora's name. And then make sure you go to the bottom click on her journey uh, bio. It's very different than her professional bio. Um, but tomorrow we're going to be hosting with the certified delegate spokesman of the rest of the clan um, is going to be at, um, what are we at, uh, 9 a.m. on Facebook Live again, we come back, um, and that's going to be on April 8th, and we're going to be talking about um, Know Yourself, and Marcia Davies did it for the Leadership Council last week, it was unbelievable, we got, I think, 12 exceptional or maybe 14 exceptional quotes that you're going to be seeing posted out there, so I can't wait to see um, Leora hosts the delegates tomorrow because it really is about, in my opinion, the ability to share, the ability to understand herself. And uh, like I said last week, um, I didn't find myself or know my real self until I was 58. So that was two years ago. Um, and you would think that I would know, but I'll look at it as that I, my knowing myself has evolved and it changes as we go, which is okay. And that's where uh, Leora's leadership, I think is absolutely fantastic is that she's knowing herself and she's growing and be able to help others, not only in their personal life, which is number one, which is stemming and progressing into her professional life. So it's like my husband says now, he says, I knew what I was getting and didn't look at my children as baggage. He says, you were able to produce phenomenal kids and I want you to have my kids. I want who even thinks that way it's always the children are extra from blended marriage and I thought okay and this was you know 30 some years ago so to that being said I would love to invite you tomorrow and thank you Leora for your valuable time and spending with your family in Denver Colorado what an excitement I know you're like okay Desiree my lighting my this and that but we're being yeah. real <laughs> <laughs> all right so Thank yep. you all and have a beautiful day. And most importantly, be safe and stay healthy. And please chime back and let everyone know to share and see us again tomorrow at 9 a.m. And we will have the delegate uh, spokeswoman on staff and we're across the nation. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, Leora, and have a great one. All right, take care. Uh, bye, bye Bye, guys, bye.